Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. Hello. Hello, Erden. Can you hear me? Yes. Erden, how are you? I am amazed. I am blown away. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling you from my yellow rowboat. About 580 miles east of the Marianas. Amazing. Okay, we are in totally different experiences right now, different realities. So since I last spoke with you, what have you done? Well, since we last spoke, I... When did we last speak? That was in Gig Harbor, wasn't it? It was just before... Uh, did we speak... Uh, yeah, a few weeks before you left. Yeah. So, um, since we last spoke, I took my rowboat to Crescent City in Northern California. And I took off from there on the Pacific on June 22nd. After 80 days of uh, difficult rowing with uh, adverse wind conditions and a couple hurricanes trying to get me, I made it to Waikiki on September 10th, just east of Honolulu in Hawaii. And I stopped there trying to resolve visa issues to Ghana, and uh, I had repairs to make, improve my watermaker performance, and a few other things. Also, most importantly, time the seasons. So I stayed there until October 7th, and then I relaunched. And since then, uh, I have come within 580 miles of uh, Northern Marianas, and I am uh, directly about 2,640 nautical miles west of Waikiki where I started. So it has been quite the journey. And the difficulty now is all the winter storms passing north of me. They originate uh, around the Korean Peninsula and then launch across Japan. They generate a lot of swells from the northwest. And following that yeah, comes a high pressure system extending from, you know, Siberia and Mongolia. Somebody out here, and then that means northerly winds right after that. So it's been these forces on the water that have been either slowing me down or trying to press my course further south. And I need to stay about uh, 19 north or so, 19, 20 north or so, to be able to line up to pass through Luzon Strait to get into uh, China Sea. And that's been my battle. So I think this January, the next four weeks, uh, into February will determine the fate of my crossing if I don't have the confidence that I can clear it was on straight I mean I'd have to go for broke uh, commit and hope that the course you're trying to just east of the Luzon Island would lift me into Luzon Strait but if not then I shipwreck on Luzon Island that's a big risk so I'm looking at alternate landing sites like Legaspi and uh, the Philippines, or even south end of the Philippines like Mindanao. But I would have to commit very early to make those kinds of drastic force changes. I really hope that I can make it through the Zon Strait and then get into South China Sea. So that's the gist of what I am. I have been up to. I am over two-thirds done with the distance to Hong Kong. The news that I'm getting is that because of the Omicron uh, variant of uh, COVID, the uh, Chinese authorities have closed the border again with Hong Kong. So now I'm debating, okay, if I get to Hong Kong, then what do I do from there? I need to travel over land to, to Nepal. I have a whole journey planned, so there's a good chance I may have to uh, divert and go to Vietnam and see if I can route to Laos and Myanmar and 
in the engine at all. So I need to create options at this point. If China opens by then, I can go from Vietnam to China. It'd be so much easier as far as visas go. Right. But uh, that is a big looming question mark right now. But at this point, I'm not thinking that far ahead. One way or another, if I make landfall, when I make landfall, I will start worrying about visas and what to do after arrival. Yeah. So at this point, my struggle is just maintaining my latitude and registering westerly progress, really. Okay, so Erden, um, just to make it real for people, what what is your daily schedule like? For example, when I shared with people right now where you are what you're doing it's mind-blowing what is your routine well the routine is typically uh, first of all i have to choose a route uh, that would allow the ocean to help me so i would have to study the winds the swells the currents and then use those forces to my advantage and then fight to stay on that route that I've designed. So when the boat wants to deflect from that route for random reasons, I would row over time to get back on that route to stay close to it. Or if I am changing from one regime to one another or from one current regime to another, over time is definitely required. Mm-hmm. So... Typically, I would wake up in the morning and stay on the oars uh, right up to dinner time. And if the boat is doing what I like, I let it be. If not, I plan some extra hours on the oars. So when I had adverse winds, for example, last two weeks, I would get winds and swells from the north. If I let the boat be, we will try to run south fast more south than I'd like. So I would row during the day to maintain latitude, and then at night I would put out a para-anchor, that is a two-meter radius parachute that is deployed uh, deep in the water. So it grabs the bottom side of these waves as they come rolling. The top side comes at you, the bottom side goes away from you. So sometimes the boat will even move toward the waves. Uh, in that case, it tends to stay fairly put. It at least is not drifting wildly with the winds. Mm-hmm. But then that is not running with the seas, right? So I'm not making progress when I'm doing that. I am sort of stalling yeah. to really slow down the pace. And that's been the case the last two weeks, which has been very frustrating. What is your sleeping like? Like, how many hours of sleep do you get in a day? Do you take naps? Do you, how regimented is that? Depends. The typical routine is uh, it is really it is really hot in the cabin during the day. So, especially now that I am in the tropics, I am at eighteen point eighteen and a half degrees or so. Uh, it is hot right now. It is really not comfortable during the day. So I would have to sleep at night, and I still wake up drenched and have to lose my T-shirt and myself in the morning. I try to get my eight hours of sleep every day. Wow. If I don't, then I am building sleep deprivation. Yeah. If I am putting overtime, which I have done, especially trying to break free of California's winds, uh, trying to get to break away southwest of Hawaii, I had to uh, put in 18-hour days, wow. 18 hours on the oars. I would sleep four hours at night, wake up, start rowing, and then uh, take a two-hour nap. Epic. And then I would get back on the oars, and the only breaks that I would take would be to pick our food, eat it, and get back on the oars, kind of thing. Amazing. So I was awake 18 hours a day. For five days in a row in one episode where I had to take advantage of a cold front that passed over my boat, changing the winds to my advantage ever so slightly. That was really my great free out of jail card right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I took advantage, but it cost me sleep. Mm -hmm. I am very much aware of the fact that I'm sitting in a room rather comfortably 
you're sitting on on a rowboat out at sea and you've been connecting to people uh through through social media and one of the things that was so endearing was the is it a blue-footed booby that landed uh it was a red-footed booby right right now i have a dark morph red-footed booby that is mostly brown i had one that had uh, mostly white features and that guy stayed with me for a while and uh, <laughs> i was able to pet it scratch it fluff its uh, feathers help it scratch gathered uh, flying fish off my deck as morsels for it, and uh, unfortunately, there weren't too many flying fish dropping on the deck. I couldn't keep eating it. Uh -huh. Eventually, it took off right on Christmas Day. It stayed with me for five days. It was wonderful company. Amazing. amazing. For people who are listening, the, the booby is, a, is, a, is basically it's a, it's a bird. It's the size of a seagull, I guess. And uh, it was amazing to see it land on the oar and then come closer and closer to you, and then you documented it beautifully with these photographs. Yeah. When I saw that, it was tear-inspiring. What is the feeling that you feel the most? When I encounter wildlife like that? Anything. Any of, like, in terms of the physicality, in terms of the experience, in terms of... I mean, what you're doing right now is historically epic. So how do we connect a listener to what you're feeling in your body and in your head... I think what well, the emotion, the feeling that I have most is uh, gratitude. I am able to pursue my dream. I have that luxury. I have been able to uh, organize my life. I have a wife, a strong partner in what I do. She not only supports this, she also encourages this. She knows the value of this in my on my psyche to believe in the cause we are willing to separate for a while each other and uh, reunite even in a stronger uh, partnership mm -hmm. I am able to challenge myself physically I am 60 years old I am still healthy I have my aches and uh, squeaks but uh, hey that's life and I am able to keep this engine still going. And also, I am able to serve science. I am gathering data for uh, research of whales, beak whales specifically, sound data whenever I can, in conditions that will allow it. Mm -hmm. Trying to raise awareness about plastic pollution in the ocean. Trying to make a difference, really, uh, in the middle of this very selfish activity. If you think about it, I have basically pulled the plug on everything, and I am by myself doing my own thing. Hmm. There can't be anything more selfish than that. And uh, at the same time, when I am able to make this progress, especially the little the boat to the other side, the overwhelming feeling is gratitude. I have been allowed passage. This is no trivial matter. This is a huge undertaking. The ocean is merciless. It doesn't care if I am uh, seven foot tall or five foot tall or a male or a female. It doesn't care. It doesn't make any difference for it. I am in insignificant uh, when it comes to the ocean. It's inanimate. And what gives it meaning is the challenge that I have defined and the struggle that I am going through. And when I survive it, I have to to tell. And that story is valuable. That's an allegory for life. <laughs> yeah. Can you make a selfie of, or a photograph of just the scene that you see right now? Uh, well, the selfie is uh, it's going to have to be a description of what's around me. I am looking at myself. I see gray skies, uh, monsoon white skies, full of cloud and rain under it. That is to my south and west. Fairly clear to my north, but uh, I am getting these weather systems going over me right now, and I am expecting a cold front to pass, making for difficult seas. Oh, wow. So right now it is about 
10 to 15 knot seas and rain all around. Almost half the compass is gray. Wow. Erden, uh, I can only, I, speaking of gratitude, I can only say thank you so much. Thank you. You're, you're a legend. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to reach your audience, and uh, we'll do this again. Yeah, for sure. Hammer on, man. Only good things. Thank you. Shooting it raw?